Um, so I'm going to go ahead and press record and we will start uh, with our introductions of our moderators and panelists. So uh, Brad and Elijah, I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you guys if you want to kick things off. Awesome. Thank you, Victoria. Um, hi, my name is Brad Widener. I'm a fourth year out of five uh, studying finance in the College of Business and currently serve as the president of SAC. Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Uh, my name is Elijah Kelly, and I am currently the VP of Alumni Affairs for SAC. Um, I mentioned earlier, this is our last day before we transition to the new exec board. So happy to, to end my term on exec with a bang and a, a really exciting event that we hope you will all enjoy. So we're going to go ahead and have our panelists introduce themselves, um, including their name when they graduated, um, where you're calling in from, and your favorite UC logo. And Victoria will be sharing a slide for you all to refer to. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share now. And then if you guys just want to um, call on people down the list, that should work. And we'll start with Chris and Judy. Hi, I'm Chris Elmbacus. I'm class of 1983, uh, College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, I had a great college career. I just want to say I was student body president, student senator Cincinnati, uh, Kadusha. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. And I was a charter member of SAC. So it was a great time. And we're here in our home in Cincinnati. And this is my fellow UC Bearcat alum and, and wife of almost 37 years, Judy Dallenbacus. Hi. Um, I graduated also from the College of Arts and Sciences just before Chris, um, and um, this is our dog, Toby. Um, I was very involved on campus at Chi Omega. I was president of Chi Omega and president of Cincinnati and a lot of other student organizations that I loved. And uh, I also worked in the admissions office for 11 years. And do you want to pick a favorite logo? Which one is yours? Well, I got to say, I like the classic, uh, the red bear cat and the little sweater with the C, um, second to the top right. Um, I like that one also, but I also like the far left one, my left, um, with the slanted, yes, um, hello. This one, the one on my shirt? This one, the one that is on Chris's shirt, yes. I've never seen the one that looks like a groundhog. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, that's so so deceptive they had to put the word bear on him <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of cool things like that in the archives we can dig up all right april you are up next hi hi everyone my name is april gable i am not a current alum yet i will be graduating in spring 2023 i have the honor of being all with you as the current student and i have to say my favorite Bearcat logo from there always has to be the baby Bearcat. It's the gray Bearcat. Um, but I'm going to give a huge honorable mention to the Groundhog-esque looking logo. Because if you just look at that, amazing. Let's put it on a t-shirt. I'm ready. There we go. Brandon? Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, Brandon Train, 2015 graduate of the College of Business, uh, still here in Cincinnati. Uh, you'll have to drag me out of the city kicking and screaming. Uh, happy to be here. Favorite UC logo on that slide is actually as a kid of the 90s, um, the one where the Paul's reaching up into the into the Cincinnati. Um, obviously, a lot of basketball memories with that logo. But honestly, my favorite one right now is the one on the baseball uniforms, the 1950s throwback. That is a good looking logo. So, happy to be here and share some stories today. And Jerry. Hello, everyone. My name is Jerry Sai. I am a graduate of the College of Arts and Sciences, 2008. I'm calling in or zooming in from Columbus, Ohio, uh, the second best city in Ohio. And my favorite logo of the choices there is the one with the red background. It reminds me a lot of what the mascot looked like when I was in school uh, and you know enjoying all the sporting events and campus activities. Looking forward to a fun panel. Cool. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we are going to 
uh, kick things off, Elijah and Brad, if you want to start the questions, I'm going to quickly uh, throw a spotlight on some of our panelists so that we can get everyone's faces up here. Great. Yeah. Our first question is for Judy. Uh, Judy, you're instrumental in reviving the homecoming queen tradition, um, and it's still carried on to this day. Can you tell us about what that process was like and, and what the reception was from students on campus? Um, yes. Um, so Chris Demakis was the executive director at the time, and I was on the homecoming committee, and he asked me and um, Chuck Eckert, who was an adult, if we would bring back the um, homecoming queen. Um, and it was lost in the 60s because of all the unrest and everything. Um, so um, I had been involved with the DMLA 7th District Sweetheart Pageant. Um, DMLA is the Young Men's Organization of the Masons. And so I was Montgomery Sweetheart, Don't Anybody Laugh, and then 7th District, which was for all of Cincinnati. And um, so there was a gentleman who was in charge of that program, Skip Carpenter. And I went to him because we wanted this to be more, we didn't want this to be a beauty pageant or anything like that. We wanted it to have an interview. We wanted to have um, academics be a huge part of it. We wanted activities and, and so forth. So he put the program together. And of course the, the highest part of that or the most, the largest part was the interview. And, um, so I was interviewed by the news record. Chris is looking at me because this is not a fond memory. Um, there was a, like a two or three points were poise and grace. The news record um, reporter, <gasps> poise, grace. Poise, yeah, poise and grace. Why would you ever have that? And so I just made a little joke and said, which I've learned never with the press to ever joke ever again. And I said, oh, could you imagine if, you know, the homecoming queen is walking up to the president to be crowned and she trips and falls. Um, so that reporter decided to write an article and it was a fictitious um, young woman at UC um, who was had disabilities and that I was not allowing her to be a part of the homecoming queen um, competition. Um, I had, I was living at the Kyle house. I will tell you the phone was ringing off the hook um, that I was a horrible person. And I even had some story sisters saying, you don't, that's not you. So I contacted the editor and he was, I have to say, so horrified because people really believed, I think her name was Sally and people believe she existed. And so he came over and he met with me and we talked about it. And he luckily when they print a retraction, it's like this big, luckily it was, this person doesn't exist. And and so forth. So life was so much better after that. Um, and it's, I'm so pleased that it continues to today. Um, the next year they added the homecoming king aspect to it, which was really great. But um, my other little thing that happened, I wasn't sure if I was going to share this, but I do hold a title, not homecoming queen, but um, the following year, my senior year, I was nominated by two organizations for homecoming queen. And all of a sudden, there was a rule that said um, anyone involved with the homecoming queen um, program could not be nominated. And this was after the fact of me being nominated. And um, so, and then that the next year that rule was gone. So I am the only person that was never allowed to be even nominated for homecoming queen. So I think I need a sash Victoria that like says that or something. So, um, but I am really pleased that it continues. And every time it's one of my favorite things at, at homecoming is to see who's being um, crowned. And Victoria invited me to be involved the last couple of years. And that's been really exciting to review the questions and, and be a part of, of that aspect. So anyway. So. Judy, I will definitely get you a sash. And thank you for plugging an excellent volunteer opportunity. If any of you on the call would like to participate as a homecoming court application or interview judge, uh, please feel free to reach out to me after this panel. It's really fun. It's a really interesting way to see um, what's going on on campus and, and the variety of people um, that are um, you know, being nominated and what they're doing on campus. It's really exciting. So I encourage you to do it. Yeah, and I'm interested to hear from April, who just won Homecoming Princess uh, this past year, what her experience was like being a part of Homecoming Court. 
Oh, my sash is standing right there. I still look at it. I still get so excited. Um, the process was insane. Um, it actually led me to be joining SAC. So I'm very thankful for it. So how it started out for present day, even during COVID, we got nominated by different organizations. I was nominated through the Bearcat Bands, the Go Band team. And then from there, you turn in an application with four different essays, just explaining different things about you. There was a question on there about a time capsule. And I was like, I don't know what to put. I, so I talked about a pin, but it really meant a lot to me. And then from there, they brought down from about Victoria, you know the numbers better than I do. I know McKenna's on the call too, so she'll probably know where the numbers fall out, but like about 100, 100 applicants were turned in and then we brought it down to 20, the top 20 to interview. From there is the top 10 that got to go into voting across the student body and then we got the top five. Um, and then I got chosen to be homecoming court princess alongside McKenna Johnson, who is one of those Bearcats right now that I have looked up to for so long. So I had like this all-star moment just standing next to her, but really cool experience. One of my best friends, Josh Squirrel, um, was the first ever um, UC Bearcat Band's homecoming king. He's also on this call right now. So it was a really great experience and just being able to keep those traditions going strong when we have a pandemic going on. And it was nice to bring a little different stride into our football games this past year. Awesome. We can um, go ahead and move on with our second question. This question is gonna be for Brandon. Um, so for those of who don't know, Brandon is kind of the brainchild behind the den, which is a tailgate spot for a lot of young alumni. Um, Brandon, can you tell us what inspired you to organize this and kind of how it's sure. over the years and how your undergraduate student experience played a role in this? Yeah, no, I, I laugh because it, it's evolved over the years. Um, yeah, we have a lot of fun with it. But the idea started to just be a place to, to stay connected with, with friends um, from, from undergrad. Uh, you know, after graduation, we didn't have our chapter meetings or our, our SAC meetings to go to. So we felt like it would just be a good venue and it made sense. Sports bring people together and football season is a lot of fun and, and a tailgate group. Um, at the time, we just had a plot on Sigma Sigma Commons since then, we've been able to program the Bearcat Tailgater, which has been the historical Sigma Sigma Tailgate and kind of combined forces there. Um, the den, the name, actually came from what the student section was called in Fifth Third Arena in the mid 2000s. That was organized by Rally Cats. That name died off, which is now sponsored by the athletic department, which is called the Ruckus. Um, so I kind of stole it and applied it to my fun little tailgate group. Uh, your second part of the question, how did my undergraduate experience, it, it, it was just kind of an extension of the work that I did on campus between student spirit, student government, the athletic department. Um, you know, For me, I've always um, sort of been drawn to the sports element, like, like many of us are. It's a really simple way to bring people together. And uh, I, I did different versions of that. Um, in my undergraduate years um, and really tried to, to keep that going um, and just, you know, create a space for, for people to see each other and, uh, and stay connected. Uh, yeah, that's so awesome. I know um, a lot of young alumni really value having a spot to go definitely before games, just yeah, because they're all going there for the same reason to cheer on the Bearcats and you give them an outlet for that. So super yeah. awesome, super cool. Highly recommend the den. We're recruiting. If anyone wants to help, you know, we need some young blood. And uh, we're excited to get back and see everyone this fall, hopefully, on, on the comments. Absolutely. Cool. So kicking it back over to April, um, as a member of the Bearcat Bands, and I know we have some band members on this call, um, what are some game day traditions that the band has that the average student or alumnus attending the games or watching on TV may not know about? Goodness. Okay. Yes. So we are marching into our hundredth and first year this year. So we would have had our big centennial band celebration last year at homecoming, but you might be thinking, oh my goodness, I missed that. No, we're going to do it again this year. So make sure to come out for the homecoming game. I believe it is the first weekend of November. So mark that on your calendars. Um, but with that being said, a little 
fun fact about the twirlers is that if you know a traditional style baton, I'm, a, I'm the fe- one of the featured twirlers for the bear cap bands, I should say that. Um, we have a small and we have a large end. And traditionally, don't let my coaches hear this outside of it. We're supposed to toss from the little end up. Um, but at Cincinnati, we do it left, like the, the big end up. I should grab a baton and show it. Um, but with that being said, it's because of the wind here. So how nipper it is, is because of just the weird structure. The wind just comes and hits our batons at different angles. So we hit with our high our heavy end up so if you ever watch us twirl you'll always see the big end which is bad for twirling technique so again please do not tell my coaches hopefully they won't see this part of history as it's being recorded Um, but moving on you are not allowed to cut through the band if you ever see us marching through 300 members strong no outside member of the band is allowed to cut through us it's also looked really bad on fellow members to cut through different sections to say like you're just trying to go grab um, your plume that you left in the band room you cannot cut through the trumpet section it's it's a big no-no. So when you're walking to tailgate, when you see us marching to Sigma Sigma, just make sure nobody's coming through the band. It really does mean a lot to us. We also do a uniform inspection before every single showing to make sure that all pieces, all parts are in the right way. Um, but with that be, being said, we also have sea paws. So for the twirlers, we have a sea paw always in our hair so we can keep up with the tradition. We are only allowed to be wearing a paw in our hair because of the tradition. And why that is, is because we do good luck taps. So before every single performance, you have to go up to each other. You're supposed to go up to each other because we all want good luck and knock on um, each other's paw. So it's typically like right over the heart as well as like on your head. Um, and then I already mentioned that uh, Josh Squirrel is our first homecoming king. That was really cool having a homecoming king. And homecoming princess this past year but the band this past year was very fortunate to be able to go and attend a lot of sporting events we did not miss a single home football game so even if the nippert was a little less than it usually is we kept up the ruckus as well as they got to go and perform at different basketball games and got invited throughout the, the community which is really cool so looking forward to seeing all that this band gets to do as we move forward we have more and more students that are getting involved on campus. So it's kind of cool to see the, the different band kids pop up through our campus. Yeah, great to have the, the bands continue to support our athletic teams, especially when uh, capacity has been has been limited. That's awesome. And on that note, you can um, confirm or deny this. I think I heard it from Josh Squirrel, but I also could be lying. Um, I didn't know before this year that it was always a tuba who yelled, get them up cats. When oh, yeah. you put your hand up when they're shooting the free throw. Um, I just assumed it was like a different person, whoever wanted to shout it in the band. Like I always knew it was from the band, but I didn't know it was always a tuba that did it, yep. which is kind of always cool. tuba as well as for like, Hey baby, it's always supposed to be a tuba from what I was told by old tuba alumni. So Josh can confirm or deny that, but yeah, the tuba is definitely like, and the chain of command, they're just Right next to Mr. Nectar. They're all the way up there. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Still uh, kind of directing towards April on this question, but also Jerry. Um, So this kind of goes back into Cincinnatus. So there are a bunch of people on this call who are uh, members of Cincinnatus, but a lot of people don't know Cincinnatus was very different back then. Um, It actually used to be part of kind of like the Roar Tour Guides was taking the place of the World Tour Guides and the admission office. Um, But uh, when Jerry was a student, the Nearly Naked Mile was created. Um, So Jerry, if you want to tell some people what that that event was like um, and how students kind of received that. And then April being our past Nearly Naked Mile chair, um, you can kind of talk about that role today and how it's changed. Yeah, no, thanks, Brad. Appreciate it. Uh, a couple comments on some of the things that I heard from my fellow panelists before we, we get into the story around uh, Nearly Naked Mile. Um, uh, want to second Judy's point that if you're an alum and you want to participate in the homecoming review process, it is actually a lot of fun. Uh, it, as a former king, it's it's great to re-engage, see the amazing students that you get to that are part of the current undergraduate classes and so forth. So I would, I would second that point to if you want to engage and stay connected, great opportunity. Um, and then to, to Brandon, the den, I, uh, the that was actually created when I was an undergrad as well. Credit, a lot of credit goes to a guy named Brad Johnson. 
um, uh, who, who was the man behind that idea. Uh, and I want to say that the things that you do in your undergrad actually connect you for the rest of your life because I was visiting North Carolina where Brad lives in Raleigh. Um, and we made sure, even amidst a pandemic, to grab lunch together. And it's been 15 years since we were an undergrad together. Uh, and so we've stayed connected. So those type of things actually stick with you for a while. So um, be sure to cherish those relationships if you're currently an undergrad. Brandon, you, un you unmuted for a hot second. I don't even want to add something there. You know, if Brad has, uh, you know, a box of dead t-shirts in his basement from, from his undergrad days, you can just go ahead and mail them right here. Yeah, we'll do. I'll be sure to mention that to him. <laughs> so forth. Uh, and now, now to the nearly naked mile. Um, so uh, this idea was actually, we'll say borrowed from another university uh, that uh, we happened to meet at a, I believe it's called Case ASAP conference. So it's the student like alumni association group conference from across the nation, all these different, essentially student alumni councils get together. Uh, the one that we attended was in Columbus, actually where I'm currently at, uh, at the time. And Nate Smith, so credit to Nate Smith as well, uh, he and I met and got to know the, the student alumni folks from, from University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, and they were really great people. And they shared this idea of like, hey, we actually have our, our student body run half naked around campus. Uh, and and I, caught our, I caught our attention for some reason. We have no idea why. Um, perhaps it was at the time they were really cute girls and we're like, oh, okay, interesting. Uh, interesting idea that you have there. And, but we took this idea back. And so we were sitting, I remember we were in TUC, Nate and I were like, we should do this here. Doesn't seem super complicated. We should totally do this here at, at, at UC. If I remember correctly, it was a table right next to where the entrance is to like the theater um, on that level of TUC, if you know what I'm talking about. We're like, okay, let's do it. What group should we do it with? And we're like, well, we could we could do it with student alumni council. It was because of that conference that we, we wanted to do it. We could, uh, you know, try to figure out what, what other groups. It could be student government, otherwise. What we realized was that there were a lot of regular already established what in our minds at the time were traditions that each student group kind of had. Uh, Sigma Sigma and, and uh, Sigma Phi had, had the carnival, which has been going on for you know 70 plus years. Uh, Meta Metro and Quest have the talent show and so forth. And we realized Cincinnatus really didn't have a signature event each year. Uh, and so we, we created that connection between Cincinnatus and the Nearly Naked Mile. Uh, the novelty of it was really really cool and and it was a low lift type of event you only run a mile uh and, and it seems kind of fun we, we want to make sure it was when it was kind of cold uh makes it a little bit more dramatic if you're nearly near, nearly naked uh, when it's cold out uh and the cause was a big part of it that that charity element you come with your coat and then you donate your coat or or, or you could give a monetary donation at the time uh, i'm not sure if that's how it continues to go and then you run a mile, essentially. And then, of course, we, we established uh, you know, post-event activities around it as well. Uh, and that was 2007 when we did the very first one. Uh, and it's, it's really cool to hear that you know, 14 years later, it is 2021, it continues to this day. I think it speaks volumes to the idea of when you hit, have a really great idea that both benefits the, the, the student body and the community, it has a lot of momentum to continue going for years and years to come. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to April and hear what the update is. I haven't heard an update on how the event's going. So, sadly to say, the Nearly Naked Mile was unable to be run this past year since of COVID. Um, I was a spring 2020 tap for Cincinnati. So this was my first leadership role. So why I dove right in specifically to this role is because putting myself on the spot, I always have had band practice when we ran the mile. So for like my first two years, I always watched it and like watched vicariously through the nearly naked people running past the band field all the time. Um, but since then we've had it develop in different ways. It's become a big tradition, like you said, of Cincinnati, but also um, some students like typical day students won't know that it's Cincinnati and they just think it's, it's you, the University of Cincinnati just runs a nearly naked mile every homecoming week. But, um, but since then we've had PAC help out, student government, Main Street, UC Delt, IFC, um, the Student Safety Board, Rally Cats, and so on and so forth with different sponsors. Um, 
pulling up some notes that I have that I'm super excited. So this year we were trying to do a virtual format, um, just but with everything going on, we figured, you know what, we'll just bring it back even bigger and better next year. So I'm looking forward to that. But we start in a loop and we run um, through Sigma Sigma and then all the way back around, get in that leg day. And it is still for St. Uh, Vincent de Paul um, and uh, volunteering for that. And typically we have about a hundred different attendees come out, you know, give or take, usually on the heavier side as we have Bearcat come out and run in his underwear, which is always a scene to see. But yeah, it's a really exciting process as well as just making sure that we're getting that tradition out there. I think that's something that really stands about, out about our university is from what I've heard as my time in Roar, when the different alumni come back with their students, they say that this has had such a great impact on them, but they viewed it as a commuter school. But then when you when they jumped in and they're like, I used, used to view it as that, but then I kept on seeing all the tradition that came out and just to be able to sit here 20, 30 years after they attended and see all this tradition is in the play and being like, I don't know what you're talking about a commuter school. Like we have a nearly naked mile. We have game days and all these different things that really makes UC put itself on the map. What, what I wanna know, Jerry, did you have a Bearcat in underwear? Uh, I don't think the Bearcat was in underwear for that first uh, first event that that we did. Um, in fact, I think we barely had 50 people. I think that attended. So the fact that it's it's grown to over you know in the hundreds now is pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, it's 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 really cool to hear that those type of things continued. Cool. Well, swinging it over to Judy and Chris. Um, as co-chairs of the Bicentennial Celebration, what was it like to see uh, eight years of, of planning come to fruition to celebrate this massive milestone in uh, UC's history? And how has your affinity towards the university developed since your time spent at UC? Well, I, I have to say on behalf of both of us, it was a, it was a great honor to be asked by uh, the then chairs of homecoming, Tom and Marty Humes, to be uh, commissioners for the Bicentennial. And, and, and we loved it. It was a great honor. And, uh, and it was a great 18 months of celebration. Uh, but my two favorite moments were, um, uh, you know, Daniel Drake was the founding doctor of the UC Medical School 202 years ago now. And um, we did a plaque dedication and a ceremony at, uh, at the medical campus. And it was awesome. And it was wonderful. And there's a big, beautiful bronze state plaque that's up now. And uh, um, people came and shared historical stories. And it was a beautiful moment. I, I have to say, I, I absolutely love that. And I knew a little bit about Daniel Drake's history, not nearly enough, but I had no idea that there was a museum to him inside the, uh, the medical college, right? Uh, maybe 50 feet from where the, the plaque is. I highly encourage it. It's a, it's a minute's well spent. But my favorite thing that we did, she's gonna talk about the bash, but my favorite thing, uh, from the very beginning, we didn't want it just to be about celebrations. We wanted it to be about celebrating academics and to be enriching and to show off why, why we all came here, which was for the academics. And um, there, so there was an academic weekend. I can't remember what we called it. Do you remember what we called it? I don't remember what we called it, but there was an academic weekend and it was topped off with the, uh, with the light show on the, uh, on the back of TUC. And that was uh, amazing. But that day was wonderful. And there were, there were lectures and things going on all over campus, a tour of Rebushaw Hall, which was called A1, if you're my age. And um, uh, so there was all, all kinds of things going on in, um, at TUC, including a um, historical goggle, uh, 3D animation, virtual reality, a historical walkthrough of the campus. But um, I, 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 it was just so amazing to see what the students were learning and what the professors were talking about. And I went to this event, I'll never forget, it was a one hour event, and it was something like 13, um, uh, um, uh, 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 what do you call it, doctoral presentations in 60 minutes. And so literally these people who like their life studies was about something, stood up and talked about this, it was their master's thesis or their doctorate thesis, and it was all summed up in like three minutes. And so these students stood up, talked, sat down, and it was amazing, but just to hear um, a, a student who was like 22, 24, who got her master's by coming up with an idea to power a smartwatch with carbon nanotubes. And uh, ironically, I just attended a, 
a presentation by a professor and a grad student making carbon nanotubes. I don't know if you've ever seen a carbon nanotube, but it's like it's literally invisible and it's uh, and it, yet it, it transmits uh, power and heat. It's, it's kind of an amazing um, uh, discovery and technology. But I mean, to hear a student come up with an idea like this, then come up with it and develop it and make it and prototype it, uh, it was it was wonderful. I just loved what I learned. So I was I was really happy to see all the wonderful learning and all the uh, discoveries that are still happening at the University of Cincinnati are happening at a greater pace. Um, Russell Best put up on the screen that it was called Community Week. Oh, um, Community we, Week. Thanks, know, Russell. Over the years of discussing it, we named it a lot of different things. <laughs> That's so, true. Um, you know. That's true. Yes. But we also, of course, we wanted that part about the academics, but we also really um, wanted to have a huge party. And um, we were talking about this earlier that um, we originally had chosen the that Saturday um, in November. And um, I all of a sudden got a phone call from Jen Heisey. And she said, Can, I know Chris is out of town, but I really need to sit down and talk with you. And I thought, uh-oh. And, and she said, give me 10 minutes, wherever. So we met and she said, um, we just got the homecoming schedule and there's a game when we wanna have the bash. And, um, and, they, I, and Victoria was with her. I think um, they thought that they were gonna have to pick me up off the floor. But um, I immediately went to let's just move it to Friday and um, and have a big you know weekend. It'll make it even better. And that was where the alumni team was already going. So they sighed with relief that yes, you know. And I and um, so we did have that bash on Friday night. And um, having it, you know, we went round and round for years about where could we hold it. And we didn't want it, I have to say, Chris and I came in from the beginning, we did not want it to be black tie. Um, we were, um, in fact, there were quite a few people who were opposed to that. I mean, they really wanted black tie. And we said, no, this should be for everyone. And, um, and we wanted, first we talked about having it in the bubble. And then we learned that the bubble really doesn't smell very well. Um, and we'd have to bring in portalettes and things like that. We talked about having it in the student union because um, when we had homecoming um, dances, that's where they sure were. Um, but then whoever brilliant, I'm not sure on the alumni team said, let's have it you know, right in um, Fifth Third Arena and we'll use that whole place. And it was perfect to see, truly people brought their children you know, and up to, you know, 80, 90 year olds. Um, it was something for everyone. And to see um, that whole place transform into from a basketball arena into a huge party place. I will never forget um, all the excitement. People still talk about it. Um, Victoria and I were, we were talking yesterday and it was kind of like, well, how can we ever, you know, beat this, you know, meaning in um, last year in 2020 and uh, we didn't have, we didn't have homecoming. So um, I think people will be so excited to be at homecoming this year, um, whether we're having a huge bash or not. But um, and then the, the, the other thing, too, was the homecoming parade. It worked out perfectly the next day and then following with the, the homecoming game and, of course, the homecoming king and queen and um, our whole committee. We um, had them on a fire truck um, that was sponsored by the Cincinnati Fire Museum, which Chris is involved with. And that was so much fun. We wanted to thank our group because many of them had been with us the entire time. And it really was six very intense years. We talked about it prior to that. And then there were six very intense years of planning. And um, so we wanted to thank them and everyone had so much fun. So Victoria, you always worked so hard, you and your team on the parade. And it was, it was a, a blast to be in that. And we're really honored. We love the university. We met at the university. We always talk about this. Some of our very, very closest friends to this day um, are are you see people and and that we met through Cincinnati. I mean, Chris and I met through Cincinnati and it's amazing how many couples that we know that met through Cincinnati and when we were giving campus tours and working with um, collegiate visitation days and um, things like that, that now I think the Roar um, students do. But um, so we love the university. Yeah, the, the Bearcat, or the bicentennial celebration of the Bearcat Bash was easily my top or my favorite memory from my time as a student. Being able to volunteer and work in it and 
and also be a part of it and seeing some of my closest friends and people I knew across campus and students being able to attend and take part in the activities in the bash was uh, a cool thing to see. When I want to throw a big thank you out to Jen Heisey and to Russell Best because um, they made that happen. Um, Amen. Yes, yes. Um, we went through a lot of different changes as to who we were working with at the university. We won't go into great length, but um, we've lost track as to how many people. But when we were told that Jen Heisey was going to be doing this with her team, we knew it was going to be awesome and that we were in great hands. So um, kudos to the whole alumni team. So thank you. Absolutely. And Russell, you worked your butt off on that. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy and Chris for saying that. But I have to say we had some exceptional volunteers and a group of really dedicated people and, you know, the people who kept pushing us for, you know, to really come up with a, a great experience and, I hope it's one of the most memorable things that people, you know, really, our students are telling us like, top of my experience, I'll never forget it. And that's what we really wanted. And I know that's what you all were pushing for because you still recollect your experiences now as do I. And we wanted to make sure that not only did our alumni come back and just have something great, but the students really had something to mark that moment and, you know, it was funny that night, everyone kept coming up to us going, let's do this every year. <laughs> Which, <laughs> every year. Yeah, but, no. You mean we're not doing it this November? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I do want to shout out to our, our amazing volunteers who are on our committee, because when you have a committee for eight years, that's just a really long time. And people just that kind of naturally cycle off and on. And people who in no way had time, like, you know, to start, the last two years, we had just a whole fresh group of people joined our and, existing And who group. did we go to? Our Cincinnati friends. Yeah, a we did. A lot of our Cincinnati friends mm. were the ones that, that came in. That's and true. Um, Yeah. But people like Dick and Gail Friedman and Linda um, Gerbers, Gerbers um, Connor. Connor now, um, they, they were with us from the very beginning and stayed with us. Awesome. Um, for our next question. Uh, we actually have three past and current student body presidents on the call. Um, we had Chris back in, I guess he graduated in 83. Jerry graduated in 08 and then April as our current student body president. Um, how do you think as SACers we can better involve um, your traditional UC student in a lot of the traditions that we've talked about today? All right, because no one's talking, I guess I'll talk. <laughs> Hard question. No, um, that's a great question. I, I think that's a question that we've asked every, every year uh, because that's a goal that we should be striving for every year's further engagement. Uh, it's a testament to the fellow panelists and, and the alumni who are on the call to say that those experiences when, we're, when, when we were on campus or, or active for, on, in undergraduate years, you know, stay with you for the rest of your life. Uh, and those relationships. So that question and that goal, I think, is is, is incredibly important to to have. Uh, as I thought about this, this was a, this actually was a tough question. It's like, what what could I lend now that I'm a little older? You know, been graduating for a while. That could be applied to the current students who are who are actively trying to do this. I think it's two part. One is an idea around value add. Uh, it's applied in sales a lot, which is kind of a little bit of what I do in the business world and, and whatnot. It's like, what value are you bringing to, as, as Brad, you, you termed as a traditional student? Maybe not the one super engaged, but comes to class, maybe a little bit has friends groups, you know, bounces around campus and all that. What's in it for them? Um, why would they want to engage in the different activities or otherwise? What is that value add that you are bringing to them uh, that is beyond, you know, obviously the, the they're active in their academics. That's why they're at the University of Cincinnati and so forth. But what, what would the other stuff around that bring to them? And so I think that question is, is, is where you center your, 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 your conversation. And in particular, I think, and this is the part that a lot of people skip, is you do the research and validation. If you don't actually go and ask that traditional student what is in it for you to attend or not attend this event, what triggers you? What is your motivation to do or not do? And you're not engaging in those conversations. 
whether through surveys or one-on-one or randomly, you know, in the in, at, at a residence hall or at the you know center court, you know, the the food halls and all that fun stuff. You're never really going to learn because you can have it all in your own head, and you can ask your friends who are also involved, but you're going to probably go in a circular motion of of what it is. So the two parts is figure out that value add, and it's going to be different, and it's going to change over time. But then really research and engage with it, and engage the people that you're you're, you're seeking after. So those were my two two thoughts on 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 the question. April. Yeah, sure. So I just came off of campaigning for these elections. Um, and unlike any year in 21st century nature, it was completely virtual. So definitely a weird, a weird vibe and a different something to pick up on. Um, and how we're going to really engage students with these elections because like you said there's the typical students that are involved we have about 10 to 20 percent of our students that are actively involved in different organizations Greek life athletics and so on so how do we reach that other 80 percent how do we reach out to our branch campuses because i feel like those two campuses claremont and blue ash are often forgotten that they're still a part of the uc traditions we really want them here involved um, so one of the things that when i first saw this question i thought of was utilizing the fact that we were virtual for an entire year how are we using our network our virtual network to reach out um, putting out advertisements that are really fun for SAC this past year we did a lot of um, SAC swag bags with different game day um, incentives or you see retro sweatshirts and things like that that students really really got excited for and they found out through their Instagram stories and Instagram posts so putting out those different events in the new format as much as I love making a good poster or some Canva art to post around the university I think what nowadays with students it's become different and how are we um, reaching out to different parts of our school and through media it can be one of those major ways as well as something that I found through campaigning this past year and really having to get a hold of people's attention really fast so they're going to zone out was how does this affect you? So like you said, um, where what is an incentive for them? What is something that they're getting out of it? So different things of when it comes to traditions for the marching band, um, most people will go and do a clap for the Tower of Strength and it's supposed to be a touch. So when I told that to the Roar Tour guys, they <laughs> oh yeah, I get a little defensive about it, but it's okay. But when like we do our closing ceremony at Roar meetings, we always sing the alma mater. And before like one of our last renditions of the year, I was like, guys, I gotta stop you. It's not this, it's this. And then ever since then, a good majority of them will continue that. And so I know that's like a weird example, but just kind of letting them in, like letting the traditional students into like the insider facts, tea, I wanted to say, but I don't know if that's the best way to say it, um, as well as just kind of revamping those traditions as we go. Um, this past year, we, my, my slate, Taylor Allgood and I ran on several different initiatives for our platform, but one of those was to really bring out like some you know, hidden UC traditions. And it goes back to the alma mater, like I said, we have the fountain, we have the tower in Sigma Sigma Commons, but where's our rock? Where Where's this rock of truth? Where's the spirit rock of our campus? Um, so spoke with Victoria Coleman, spoke with SILD on potentially adding a spirit rock to our campus in some kind of way, even if it's just for like homecoming week for students to come and decorate because then that brings out a different part of our campus. So even like small things as like sharing on Instagram stories to even putting a boulder on campus for people to decorate. We really think that these are something that could bring in students to these different traditions. Well, you know what, it, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up. By the way, I knew, I knew this, but, uh, but, but I a love that. A real one. A real one. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we should talk more about the rock thing because there's a group of us that have been working on the rock for about a decade. So we, we can talk about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so, you know, it's funny, I, I, as we started up here, I saw a bunch of people we know, Christy Wolf, Chop Boy, and others, and I see all of us here, and we're not, we're not all here just because we connected through academics. We connected to other people in the university through our outside of classroom experiences. So I, I think anytime we can do things to get more people involved beyond academics and involved in embracing campus life, the better, the better the memories will be, the better the friendships will be, the better the connections will be, the better alums they'll be. Um, so uh, again, it, it needs to go beyond the classroom experiences. That's why we're all here. Um, and to into these life enriching experiences of campus life. So what are those? Anything we can do to encourage people to come together as a group, it may, maybe it's a small group, maybe it's a large group, 
uh, work on a project, be part of an organization, uh, events, gatherings, sports, um, concerts, you know, uh, talent shows, that kind of stuff. Anything that we can do like that, uh, we'll just we'll just further invest people in the university. that will give them a richer experience. Um, you know, we had a uh, we had a, a um, we had a bad accident uh, five and a half years ago. And who was the one who came and really became our solid friends who like drove my wife to the scene of the accident a couple hours away or some UC Bearcat friends we really didn't hang out with. And uh, but we were, you know, we had a strong relationship when we were students. Well, we now we're the there are our dinner companions during the whole COVID pandemic. We've become great friends, but that that relationship was seeded. It was started at the University of Cincinnati. That's some of our best, most solid friendships are. So anything we can do to encourage people to be more involved, have things. And, you know, you're talking about the nearly make the mile. Somebody talked about the carnival and somebody talked about the talent show. You know, those events were started by like Sigma Sigma and one of the reasons and, and Metro and Cincinnati that bonds that group. So if you work on a carnival together and you sweat together and you plan on something for months and months together, you as a team are bonded for the rest of your life. And that's why you want to do concerts and events and, and uh, benefits for, uh, uh, for uh, like the near, near, uh, nearly naked mile, anything like that that we can do to encourage activities, I think going to be a bonus. Great. Uh, I want to direct the next question towards Brandon. Um, if you had to recommend everyone on this call to attend one annual campus event or participate in one of the traditions that we've talked about so far in the, in this call, what would you recommend? What would that event be? Yeah, I mean, I thought about this and I, I tried to come up with something that wasn't as obvious, but uh, I, I mean, I don't think it could be understated and that's homecoming. I, I think that that event keeps growing and as each class graduates and they see the class before them coming back from Chicago's DCs, like if they've unfortunately left town or whatnot, it, people come back. And I feel like that magnet is getting stronger every year. Obviously football success helps out a little bit, but the work that the alumni association, SAC, Creek Life, everyone involved, I know I'm missing groups there. Um, I, I just feel like that, that event just keeps growing and, in, in popularity and in importance to the university. So I feel like it can't be understated. I second that, Brandon. That was what I wrote down too. I was like, it's homecoming. It's just homecoming. It's homecoming. You get to see friends of all generations. I've known Chris and Judy and Joff and, uh, and a few others on the call for, for many years, but that's when I see them every year because I know everyone will be there. So yeah, it's homecoming. I'd say homecoming too, but I also tell you, um, whenever you have a friend who graduated 20 years ago or a while ago, and they say, oh, I'm in Cincinnati or near Cincinnati, say, when was the last time you were on campus? And uh, I keep thinking like Jennifer Cox, who works as a chef in Chicago, she's amazing. And uh, she was coming to town for something. And we said, well, take time. Don't just come to Cincinnati, walk on campus. And oh, I've been to campus. I know you haven't been there for a long time. And she was student body president. Yeah, she was student body president. She, she calls, she's like, oh my gosh, campus is amazing. What happened to the, the old commons building? And, and, you know, look at this and oh my gosh, and Sigma Sigma Commons wasn't there. And anyway, I, I think anytime you can get anybody to come back to campus, it's an alum, it's a positive experience. Uh, April, do you have a, a, an event that you would recommend students attend to? Yeah, they pretty much all answered mine, so don't really have much to add. I would say out of all homecoming week, homecoming game, come and, come and test out the touch instead of the clap during the alma mater. But it's always a really great experience to look out and be on the 50 yard line and just see everybody around. Um, I, during my homecoming court panel questions this past year, that was one of my answers because my first ever moment stepping out on a collegiate field of like a lifelong preparation was seeing a completely filled Nippert Stadium. And it's just incredible to come into those games every single year, especially homecoming game and not only see students, but see 
family members and see community members and forever bear cats just always out there. So I would say definitely come and hang out on um, our homecoming game, but also come take a tour on campus. You can stop past the admissions office, the visitor center and pick up one of our tour packets and just see everything that's changed. I know even on my phone, whenever I look up to different buildings on campus, just to show the directions for students, it has like a different Google has like 2015's version of campus. Just even think like even the internet is a little outdated constantly. We're on an march with UC. So come to a homecoming game, but come a little early and take a tour around campus. Cool. Uh, well, I think we're gonna open up the last five minutes for questions from the audience. Um, audience members, if you have any questions, feel free to um, raise your hand and we can call on you or just throw your questions in the chat and they can be directed at a specific panelist or to everyone. I, just, I bet Chop Point has a good question. No, no, no questions today. You guys have been, I've learned so much just of the traditions, uh, listening to some of the old history here. I, you know, I reflect back on the presidential ball um, and some of the things we got to do through SAC and um, some of those fond, fond memories, but uh, I'm full of Bearcat pride today. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, it's been great. Thanks for putting us on. I have a question that I'll ask. Um, Chris, can you... Um, go a little bit into about how the the CPAW was created. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, the very first year of SAC, we had our the first ever national conference. It was at Nebraska. And I had never been anywhere near Nebraska before. And we drove because, of course, we're poor. And uh, so you know, we all drove in the University of Cincinnati alumni station wagon, which is a real treat. And then we uh, the next year we went to Clemson. And I'd never been to Clemson before either. And that's amazing. But about 100 miles away from Clemson, you start seeing these giant orange paws uh, on the side of gas stations, building walls. On the highway going up a hill, you see these big orange tiger paws. And um, when we got there, I bought a ton of, they kind of jokingly called them bowling shirts. I mean, they look were kind of outrageous with big bear or uh, tiger paws because we were like, we wanted to bring this back. You know, back then there was hardly any UC logo wear anywhere. And we really didn't have much of a logo. And uh, so we were all looking at this and uh, we thought, let's, let's steal this logo and do something with it. So um, a Kappa, whose name escapes me, I'm so sorry, uh, added toenails or claws to the uh, tiger paw and just changed it a little bit. And then I went to um, uh, um, Mike, Allman. Mike Allman's office, who was the outgoing vice president of the university. He, was, uh, um, he went to become a fellow in the White House during Ronald Reagan's administration. And I said, I'd like to get permission to paint giant red paws running up something called the Avenue of the Champions. And we want to put these paws everywhere. And he goes, oh, God, you don't really want to do that. I'm like, he goes, do me a favor, buy the cheapest red paint you can find. And I don't want it to last very long. So I called the state of Ohio Department of Highway. And I said, what's the most durable red paint you can find? And they, because of course, we're going to break the rules. And they said something called silicone. We bought this really expensive paint. And I had a company on the side that painted medical equipment. So we had all this professional paint gear and uh, we at the alumni house, we made these giant claw footprints and we went up, up the, uh, the Avenue of the champions. And then one of the uh, entrances into the uh, Midbridge stadium. And I have to tell you, those things lasted longer than the sidewalks because they, they, they were there until a few years. One of them was there until a few years ago when they, when they renovated Nipper and they tore out the sidewalk, it was still there like 30 some years later. Um, but anyway, so that claw, uh, kind of evolved into this. Uh, we made a bunch of buttons that said Clom Cats and SAC used to have a, a button making machine. I don't know if we still do that. And we used to make these buttons and give them away and sell them. So we did a Clom Cats button that had like, you know, UC, Clom Cats, whatever. And then that evolved into the original slanted CPAW or uh, CPAW logo, which is now the, well, this logo. Um, but uh, that's how we got there. So this evolved from the Clemson Tiger logo to the Clom Cats, to that. And I thank Mike Allman for letting me paint the campus with red paws. Who went on to be? Who, uh, who went on to be uh, 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 CEO of LVMH and JCPenney's and now he's chairman of the board of Starbucks. So um, 
and, and an amazing guy. Yeah. So that's the history. So Sack brought the the C paw to UC. That's awesome. I know we we had some comments about Case in the in the chat earlier, and and Sack this year swept all four Case awards for our district for the first time ever. Ooh. So. so Super excited and pumped to be uh, a part of this organization. Um, but I know we're at time. I just wanted to take a second to thank all of the panelists for joining the call today. Um, really nostalgic and, and prideful discussion that I had. And I know a lot of people learned a lot. So I um, just want to thank you all for joining. And thank you to our audience too.